Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the blessing of being able to come together, the blessing of your um, strength and healing that you give to us and the safety that you keep us in during these, during the time of this virus as it continues to resurge and escalate all around us, even the children now, Lord. And we can see that written in your word. We just pray for your mercy upon um, your people at this time. We pray that as people are so opposed and adamant and fighting mask wearing that just keep your people safe and, and guide and direct us, we pray. As we continue to read from the evangelicals, I ask you for the blessing of your Holy Spirit to guide and direct us and uh, in the study of this book that we would continue to glean from it more information to help us on the lines when it comes to the Protestant church and the works that they're doing. We thank you and we praise you and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I'll probably, I'll start out reading, but I have eye problems myself. Okay, so um, picking up where we left off, was page 270, delivered on March 21st, 1965, just after the Selma Montgomery marches. The sermon, Ministers and Marchers, was Falwell's first bid for regional attention. And in a pamphlet form, it was widely distributed in fundamentalist circles. In it, Falwell began by questioning the sincerity and nonviolent intentions of some civil rights, the sincerity and nonviolent intentions of some civil rights leaders, such as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Mr. James Farmer, and others who are known to have left-wing association. He went on to say that communists were exploiting the tense situation and that the demonstrations were damaging race relations if I'm following right, just kind of connecting here, left wing and communist together, right? Um, tense situation and that the demonstrations were damaging race relations. I, I think you're right, because that was what I was thinking too. Um, what made them left wing, right? Um, yeah, socialist, communist. Yeah. I think Adriana said that they, they think the two were the same. Um, but definitely, yeah. what, what, definitely the scare in this time was communism during the um, Cold War and and their threat, the threat to them was um, was communism coming in. Go ahead. I think you were going to say something else. No, uh, you finished it off. I, it's just the way they labeled them left wing off the bat, right? So. Yeah. Um, I, I might have missed something in the previous readings, but yes, like you said, they're tying it to the communists, but uh, because communists, they called lefties. Yeah. But anyway, I thought maybe there was more, you know, like to it, but yeah. that's okay. We'll keep reading. Okay. So toward the end, he talked about the involvement of church leaders with the alleged discrimination against the Negro in the South and asked why they did not concern themselves instead with the problem of alcoholism since there is almost as many alcoholics as there are Negroes. Much of the rest of, ser much of the, rest of ser the sermon was devoted to uh, the doctrine of separation. And just before we go on and read that, <clears throat> it's the same issue today where the right is deflecting and saying that's not a problem the the problem is is they're violent and they're um creating all these um tense situations and damaging relations by bringing up the critical race theory they're making something that isn't there they're you know all these different things it's all the same stuff that's going on today so okay so uh, yeah and they're tying it to socialism now yeah, which yeah. Is, was basically communism it's just a another form of communism so that, so that's what they're trying to do and they're trying to label dr fauci as um a government uh oh what do they call him 
like he's working for the government against them, right? And again, like in a conspiracy against them. Yeah, and here he, um, in his sermon, he's pointing out that the problem of alcoholism, um, you know, tr again, trying to take away from what's happening when it comes to the civil rights movement and directing to alcoholism, which is their morality, um, their morality issues. So it's a deflection, you're saying sort of he's, de like. he's deflecting it to, to, towards that? that? I mean, that's what it seems like to me. That, well, they, what do they call it? Don't they call it gaslighting or something like that today? Is that what you would call gaslighting? I don't know. I, I, I have to stop and think gaslighting through sometimes. It's, gaslighting is when they're accusing you of what you're doing. Is that what gaslighting is? It's it's more than that. It's kind of a psychological. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I'm just going to say it, it, it's psychological. And, you know, it, it, it came from a movie. And I don't remember the name of, maybe the name of the movie was Gaslighting. But it was... And it was about a husband who basically drove his wife crazy because like everything she said, he would twist or turn around and um, put it back to her like she was like she was crazy. And it's a it's a term in medical and you know my arena because to make all these patients get gaslighted because the doctor just takes what you say and turns it and, and tells you it's all in your head you're crazy and you know none of this stuff is real uh, that's a real simplistic explanation and susan probably has a better donna put um, it in here manipulate someone by psychological means into questioning their own sanity yeah yeah huh. um yeah a lot of times it, it's done in families too i mean where um maybe the parent and a sibling are in it together <coughs> against another sibling to make you feel like you're crazy and you'll remember something happened a specific way but they have they don't want to remember it that way if you're following what yeah. i'm saying and they'll they'll put a whole different context to it and make you question your own like whether you remembered it right or not it's it's kind of a it's an attack on a person yeah and it it's very um it's very damaging and Kathy explained it well too because it, it is it was named after that movie. It's an old black and white movie. I don't remember who was in it, but they were trying to drive somebody crazy in the movie. And so that's where the term came from. Yeah. Okay, so let's see, much of the rest of the sermon. So this is the sermon that he gave that went against, um, uh, you know, talking about discrimination and trying to take the, the spotlight off of discrimination and put it onto alcoholism. As far as the relationship of the church to the world, it can be expressed as simply as three words, which Paul gave to Timothy, preach the word. Um, no, nowhere are we commissioned to reform the externals. We are not told to wage war against bootleggers, liquor stores, gamblers, murderers, prostitutes, racketeers, prejudiced persons or institutions or any other existing evil as such. Our ministry is not reformation, but transformation. While we are told to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, in the true interpretation, we have very few ties on this earth. We pay our taxes, obey the laws of the land, and other things demanded of us by the society in which we live. But at the same time, we are cognizant that our only purpose on this earth is no to I think it's to know Christ and to make him known. Believing the Bible as I do, I would find it impossible to stop preaching the pure saving gospel of Jesus Christ and begin and begin doing anything else, including fighting communism or participating in civil rights reforms. 
I got confused about this because this is a sermon that he preached, right? <clears throat> so toward the end, he talked about the involvement of the church leaders with the alleged discrimination against the Negro in the South and asked why did they not concern themselves instead with the problem of alcoholism? So why did they not concern themselves more with alcoholism? And much of the rest of the sermon was devoted to the doctrine of separation. As far as the relationship of the church to the world, it can be expressed as simply as three words, which Paul gave to Timothy, preach the word. So he's saying, he's saying, Paul will, if I'm understanding correctly, that we're not commissioned to reform the externals. I don't know, I guess it just confused me because why did he just um, point to alcoholism? I'm trying to make sense out of that. So, so nowhere are we commissioned to reform the externals. We are not told to wage war against bootleggers, liquor stores, gamblers, murderers, prostitutes, racketeers, prejudiced persons, or institutions. Okay, we're to, our ministry is not reformation, but transformation. While we are told to render to Caesar, okay, so um, the Bible that is, makes no sense either, right? I, I was really our ministry is not reformation, but transformation. How on earth do you get a transformation without a reformation? <laughs> it, it's like he's talking out of both sides of his mouth. But, I mean, that's why I'm so confused. So the sermon deserves some examination. For one thing, Falwell confined the church to a narrower sphere than the separatist Baptist gospel did. Southern fundamentalists had always engaged in reforming the externals within their own ministries, and Falwell was no exception. Further, all the leading Southern fundamentalist pastors from J. Frank Norris to Bob Jones and John R. Rice had denounced the moral ills of society and the menace of communism in the course of Jeremiads? Jeremiads? Jeremiads. Is that what it's supposed to be, you think? Yeah. There's a lot of typos in this section right here, I noticed. Um, I think that's how it's spelled. Well, it would be a capital J, I would think, if it's supposed to be Jeremiah's. Yeah, but it's, I don't know that it's Jeremiah like the Bible. Look it up. It might be taken from like the way Jeremiah laments, but it it's not. Yeah, look it up. I'm not sure either. It means um, how Jeremiah mourned and complained and lamented <laughs> of the of the yep. of society and things. That's, that's called, that was my guess. Yeah, okay. that's, that's okay. what Jeremiah it is. Okay. Thanks, Donna. Okay, so let's see. It denounced the morals and moral ills of society and the menace of communism in the course of Jeremiah's about the need for revival or in the warnings that the second coming was nigh until the 1960s. Most had drawn the line on criticism of the social and economic arrangements in the South or precisely where Southern evangelicals had drawn it before the Civil War. However, with the inception of the civil rights movement, they began to preach on domestic political issues, such as desegregation and the federal government's intrusions on states' rights, their change of position being simply a move from support of the racial status quo to opposition. Falwell numbered among them, and in ministers and marchers, he was in vain against the civil rights movement and communism, even while maintaining that his gospel didn't permit it. It really sounds confusing. Falwell gradually reconciled himself to desegregation. <clears throat> he found he founded the Lynchburg Christian Academy in 1967 as a whites only school, but a year later, it accepted three African American students and one black family joined the church. Around 1970, when he began to develop a national audience, he recalled the copies of his previous sermons defending segregation so they could not be used against him. 
Ministers and marchers, however, had been so widely distributed that copies were generally available. By 1980, Falwell moved 180 degrees from his former doctrinal position on the separation of church from politics. He had vowed to undertake civil disobedience if the Equal Rights Amendment was passed. He had vowed to undertake civil disobedience if the Equal Rights Amendment was passed and Congress voted to draft women into the armed forces. When asked about ministers and marchers at a press conference in early October, Falwell called the sermon falsely false prophecy and asserted that he and his fellow ministers were doing exactly what King and his fellows had done. <clears throat> he and other fundamentalist pastors described their move into politics and their abandonment of separation as a response to the national crisis of the late 1970s. Yet clearly, the emergence of the civil rights movement had been a turning point. It had shown them that preachers could be politically effective, and it had ended their support of the status quo. Ironically, it had benefited white fundamentalists as much as it had benefited Blacks in the South. It had given them their voice back on domestic issues, permitting them to speak out against the laws of the land. It had given them their civil rights at no cost to themselves. Further, the success of the movement had removed the obstacle that would have prevented Falwell and other fundamentalist leaders from assuming a role in national politics. Had removed the obstacle that would have prevented. Still the separation of the church from the world was as much a matter of practice as it was of doctrine. It had to do with the dress Thomas Road people wore, the prohibitions they observed, even their manner of speaking. Most Thomas Road people had to spend their work day week, work a day week in the world. But otherwise, they kept themselves apart from the life of the city, taking no part in civic organizations or local politics. Lynchburg was otherwise a close-knit community where businessmen, college professors, and ministers, black and white, knew each other and generally cooperated for the common good. The Thomas Road people, feeling secure only under the canopy of their church, tended to regard the rest of the community as no more than a mission field. Falwell, for his part, actively encouraged the tension between his congregation and the rest of the city, whether in describing the dangers Christians faced when evangelizing or discovering enemies for the church in a local reporter, in a local reporter or the people in city hall. All the same, he never called for any action against these enemies or tried to make the town conform to his own moral standards. He never, for example, campaigned against such local businesses as the discotheques, I think that's a discotheque, like dancing, I think that is, what that is um, or the theaters that showed Hollywood films, or the Lynchburg plant of Meredith Berta, which for some years printed penthouse magazines. Personally, he maintained cordial relations with the local business leaders and city officials, yet civic leaders spoke of his church as if it were a foreign country in the midst of their own town. It's in Lynchburg, but not of it, one remarked to me. Wisely, Falwell kept out of Lynchburg politics all his life, thus never fouling his nest, but otherwise he moved to bring the church into the world. The process was a gradual and to some extent a matter of circumstance. In the 1960s, most of Falwell's energies went into building the Thomas Road Church, but he had always wanted to make his mark beyond Lynchburg. And in the early 70s, his electronic ministry, once just a means of bringing people into his church, took on a life of its own. Through radio and television, he could preach to more souls than Lynchburg possessed. Buying TV airtime was expensive. But Falwell and some of the other televangelists developed sophisticated fundraising techniques and employed a company to help, to help him. Using computerized direct mail, 
He made a variety of appeals, some for mission work, some to build his newly conceived college to train young Timothys, and some to keep the old time gospel hour on the air. The appeals were always changing. Those who ran his finances were, however, less than expert, and in the early 1970s, he had a run-in with the Securities and Exchange Commission over a faulty bond prospectus. This was his luck, for after his ministry <clears throat> was put into the nonprofit equivalent of receivership, five top Lynchburg businessmen put his affairs in order, and the OTGH revenues skyrocketed, going from seven million to 22 million in four years. By 1979, Falwell had 2 million people on his computerized mailing list and 35 million in receipts. Yet notably, most of the funds, five cents for every seven he raised, went into maintaining and expanding the reach of the old time gospel hour. To find backers and to promote the show, Falwell traveled the country every week in a succession of ever larger and ever faster church owned airplanes. Speaking at churches, Bible schools, pastors' conferences, and revivals, his stable of writers turned out sermons, pamphlets, books, and magazines. Pastors were important to his enterprise, and along the way, he met hundreds of them, many from the fundamentalist Baptist networks, such as the Baptist Bible Fellowship and those of Bob Jones Jr. and John R. Rice. In the early 1970s, he and his associate, Elmer Towns, wrote sermons and two books on church growth for them. In the sermons, he urged them to stop fighting over minute ecclesiastical or doctrinal differences and to unite for the sake of evangelism. This was in his interest as a TV evangelist, and according to former associates, he eventually discovered that he could reach a far wider audience by talking about family issues than by talking theology. In any case, around mid-1970s, the emphasis of his preaching changed. In the first seven months of 1975, Falwell led a road show with Liberty Baptist College, choral raising money from OTGH audiences at banquets and rallies to fill a shortfall of $3 million. The following year, that of the nation's bicentennial, he led a much more extensive tour with busloads of LBC singers, this one dubbed I Love America, at rallies with American flags flying behind them. His students sang religious and patriotic songs, and he delivered a rousing stump sermon calling upon America to return to God. Falwell's timing was seren serendipitous for 1976 was also a presidential election, um, election year, and evangelicals were constantly in the news. <clears throat> the Democratic presidential nominee, Jimmy Carter, was a devout Southern Baptist, a deacon of his church, and a Sunday school teacher, who spoke frankly about his born-again experience. President Gerald Ford, an Episcopalian, described himself as a born-again and in the born again and in competition with Carter for the South, he became the first sitting president to address the SBC convention. Charles Colson, one of the Watergate conspirators, emerged from prison with a best-selling memoir, Born Again. CBS did a primetime documentary of the documentary of the same title, and all the leading national magazines ran feature stories on evangelicals. A Gallup poll queried Americans about their faith and found that over a third described themselves as born again Christians. An additional third, which translated into 50 million adult Americans, agreed that the Bible is the actual word of God to be taken literally, word for word. So it's not a prophetic book, it's a literal book. Citing the poll, a Newsweek cover story of October 25 called The Emergence of Evangelical Christianity into a Position of Respect and Power, the most significant and overlooked religious phenomenon of the 70s. 
the publicity gave fundamentalists, Pentecostals, Southern Baptists, and other evangelicals a sense of their collective importance. And many leaders, including Falwell, cited the Gallup poll as evidence that evangelicals had become the largest religious group in the country. Amid all of this excitement, Falwell's I Love America tour attracted enormous crowds on platforms festooned with red, white, and blue bunting. He spoke of America's religious origins and the country's declension into unbelief and sin. This is a Christian nation, he proclaimed. What has gone wrong? What happened to this great republic? We have forsaken the God of our fathers. The prophet Isaiah said our sins separate us from God. The Bible is replete with stories of nations that forgot God and paid the eternal consequences. According to Gerald Strober and Ruth Tomczak, his account of the parlous state of nation, parlous state of the nation, of nation included mention of trends in the public schools, the entertainment world, and the media, and in addition to America's economic, political, military, energy, and religious problems. He ended with a stirring appeal. Will you be one of the consecrated few who will bear the burden for revival and pray, oh God, save our nation, oh God, give us a revival, oh God, speak to our leaders. The destiny of our nation awaits your answer. Clearly, Falwell was edging into politics via a Jeremiah about the need for a religious revival. In one of his crusade sermons, he preached the idea of religion and politics don't mix was invented by the devil to keep Christians from running their own country. Still, he had yet to take up the main issues that propelled conservative Christians into politics four years later. Wow. Okay, I'm going to turn it over if somebody else would like to read. I'll read for a little bit. Okay. Excuse me. In June of 1979, Jerry Falwell launched the Moral Majority, an organization designed to register conservative Christians and mobilize them into a political force against what he called secular humanism and the moral decay of the country. We are fighting a holy war, he said, and this time we are going to win. Earlier that year, two Southern California pastors, Robert Grant and Richard Zone, formed the Christian Voice to combat the gay rights movement, abortion, and the ERA, as well as the SALT II nuclear arms treaty and tra the trade embargo on white Rhodesia. The organization issued moral report cards for members of Congress and sent out mailings to thousands of evangelical ministers and hundreds of Catholic priests. In <clears throat> June, fundamental Southern Baptists, in June, fundamentalist Southern Baptists secured the election of their champion, Adrian Rogers. And the following year, the convention under their leadership passed resolutions denouncing pornography and homosexuality, rejecting the Equal Rights Amendment and calling for a reversal of the Supreme Court decision on Roe v. Wade. Okay, so I'm just gonna read this salt to, was what? So you can put in here. Salt II was a series of talks between American and Soviet negotiators from 1972 to 79 that sought to curtail the manufacture of strategic nuclear weapons. It was a continuation of the SALT I talks and was led by representatives from both countries. Okay, thank you. It seemed vaguely familiar from my youth, those words. Yeah, okay. I couldn't remember that at all, so I had to look it up. <laughs> I didn't know what it was, but um, I figured it was uh, <clears throat> something with 
nuclear, yeah, it's a nuclear arms treaty. Yeah, they were against it. It's interesting that they also, the gay rights, the abortion, the equal rights right. amendment, right? Yeah. The trade embargo on white Rhodesia. Yeah, I, I, no, it doesn't surprise me. Anyways. Um, okay, so uh, where am I? So the organization issued moral report cards for members of Congress and sent out mailings to thousands. Do you have, a, do you have your book? No, I don't have a book. Are you reading off the screen? I mean, off the screen. Okay. I think we're right here. So, okay. So, oh, did I go down here? I'm down here? Yeah. I read that. Yeah, it was just weird because oh, you were reading what I didn't see on the screen. So I asked you if you were reading out of the book. <laughs> no, thank you for putting me in the right place. Okay, so on April 29th, 1980, Pat Robertson of the Christian Broadcasting Network and Bill Bright of Campus Crusade for Christ co-chaired a Washington for Jesus rally, assembling somewhere between a quarter and half a million conservative Christians, many of them Pentecostals and Charismatics on the Washington Mall. A number of the speakers predicted that abortion, homosexuality, and the banning of school prayer would bring God's wrath upon the country. Unless we repent and turn from our sin, Bright thundered, we can expect to be destroyed. According to some, the weakening of America's moral fiber and of its military defense was inviting a Soviet attack. The scream of the great American eagle was turned into the twitter of a frightened sparrow, Adrian Rogers declared. Later, the organizers divided the marches by congressional districts and encouraged them to participate in politics. The emergence of the Christian right shocked most political observers. Dominant theories of modern politics predicted the decline of religion in public life. The amorphous civil religion of patriotism preached by Eisenhower and on occasion by Billy Graham had apparently died in the tumult over the Vietnam War. By 1980, most pundits and pollsters had come to assume that religion was a private matter and politics a secular sphere. After all, John F. Kennedy and most recently Jimmy Carter, a devout Southern Baptist, had drawn bright lines between their religious beliefs and their public commitments. That the civil rights movement had begun in the churches had been forgotten or bracketed as a phenomenon of black Americans using the only network they had to gain their rights. Also forgotten that was that in the past three decades, white evangelicals from Billy James Hargis, Hargis, Hargis to Billy Graham had spoken out on political issues and backed candidates, while the Christian right was in many ways different. White, still the white, excuse me, not while, still the white Christian, still the Christian right was in many ways different. White evangelical ministers from previously incompatible traditions were attempting to build lay support for political activism across a wide range of issues and calling for a holy war against secular, secularists and liberals. Some were claiming that evangelicals constituted a voting bloc even something like a party. Our goal is to influence all viable presidential candidates on issues important to the church. We want answers. We want appointments to government. 
Jim Baker told the reporter in November 1979, we have together with the Protestants and Catholics enough votes to run the country. Pat Robertson's, oh, Pat Robertson that's said- a, That's an interesting statement with what we've been reading. Yeah. Too, that we have together with the Protestants and Catholics enough votes, <laughs> but they're enemies. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, what do we, what does the great controversy say? They're going to clasp their hands. Um, I, I do remember hearing that. They're still there. enemies. They, they do it for their own purpose. But from what we read in that A.T. Jones document, they get to the place where the, um, I, I'm thinking it's going to be one of the things I think we need to review is the Third Diadochi War and the Babylonian Wars. Um, but the, the, um, Protestants and Catholics, they're enemies. That's what we've been seeing. They're always enemies, no matter what. Even though they use one another, they're enemies. And uh, But they'll use the Catholics to a point to their own demise. Because if you, cause the Protestants are, or the Republicans, they're the minority, right? So they seek um, Catholics to support them in the things they agree upon for their votes. But what if the Catholics outnumber the Protestants? Then, then they kind of right. pick themselves up, right? Right. You, you know what else? Um, sort of like I thought about it, but I don't know. It mentioned a few paragraphs earlier about the Vietnam War being um, a reason for um, shutting them down. And I don't know, the Vietnam War was such a horrible war. But when we read that in here, you could see how God used that horrible war to um, cut them cut them off, sort of, from what they were trying to achieve. Um, it, slowed, it slowed them down. And when you're talking about Catholics, a lot of the Vietnamese people that have come over here have become, are Catholics. So I think there's a huge... Um, Catholic uh, presence in Vietnam. Maybe maybe it was there always. I don't know. Um, so I was just thinking as you guys were talking about that Catholics and what we read in here about Vietnam. Um, we want answers. We want appointments to government, Jim Baker told a reporter in November 1979. We have together with the Protestants, oh yeah, I have to run the country. Others such as Adrian Rogers and Bill Bright claimed that they had no political agenda, that they were merely the moral, speaking to the moral crisis in the land still all had much the same message and one that clearly favored Ronald Reagan and other conservative candidates. <laughs> the eruption of the Christian right was sudden. Just three years before, there had hardly been a hint of it. Most of the issues were new and preachers like taking the lead were not the familiar faces, Billy Graham, Oral Roberts, Carl McIntyre, but men largely unknown to the national press. Many, it turned out, had churches with congregations in the thousands, a number including Pat Robertson, Jim Baker, and Jerry Falwell had a radio station, oh, sorry, I'm just I'm tired, a radio and television had radio and television broadcasts. Oh gosh, <laughs> maybe it's time for someone else. Uh -huh. oh, I'm starting that sentence again. Pat Robertson, Jim Baker, and Fidari Powell had radio and television programs broadcast across the country, though not on major networks, but on their affiliates, local cable channels, and Christian stations. In effect, they had been hidden in plain sight. Yet in 1980, they seemed to be everywhere, putting on huge conferences and mass rallies 
and giving interviews on secular TV shows. Journalists. Do, do you remember? Sorry, Kath. Do you ahead. remember when um, Jim Baker was taken down? Um, I'm trying to remember her name, Jessica. Jessica something or other. That was sort of about the time I was getting drawn into the Adventist church for my very first time. Somewhere in the mid, early mid 80s. And she was from Babylon, New York. And mm. I remember <laughs> thinking Babylon, you know, I, I was reading literally, but I just thought that was sort of interesting that she was from Babylon new york but um do you remember that when jim baker had the affair yeah I'm, yeah the, and that does come up later in the later i'm not sure how much farther into the book it comes up about their fall okay <clears throat> yeah yeah but yeah I, I do remember their fall that's all i know i just remember tammy lee with all the makeup that was just horrendous I just, I mean, you know, as a, I, I don't know, young person, I was, what, okay, I was a teenager, you know, but looking at this stuff, thinking, <laughs> this is about God, I mean, to me, it was a total turnoff, if anything, you know, if I was thinking about God at all, it was a total turnoff, but I wasn't thinking about God. But still, it was, I looked at him and thought, no way, you know, I'm, they didn't attract me to God at all. I was going to say, yeah. John, I had her confused, the, the name confused with uh, one of the presidential candidates that didn't make it because he had an affair with somebody. And I was thinking Jessica Hahn with that one. So, yeah, Jessica Hahn was the one with Baker. Donald yeah, I, I was approaching 30. So I, I remember, I remember that being all over the news and what you said, Kathy, too. I remember thinking, oh, you know, and um, they, they had cards making, making fun of, making fun of, um, I've kind of felt sorry for Tammy Baker as time went on. But initially, I didn't, I was just like the rest of them making fun of her um she i remember reading, too. did she, she i yeah, know that she died of cancer at the end yeah the, but the book the book i believe does say and because that surprised me because i knew about him but i hadn't recalled her but i believe that the book does say that she had an affair i'm looking at david it's more of a problem with drugs more of a problem with drugs, he says. Okay, okay, that could be wrong, but anyway, um, yeah, it's just yeah, it's a sad history. <laughs> sad, but in a way, I God mean, was preparing us with all that. I think about that, you know, Kath. Um, yeah, just like He's preparing the world now, you know, because these were uh, um, events that were rocking people. You know what I mean? People were definitely taking right. notice of all of this. Right. And then you see, you know, Jerry Falwell Jr. now. <laughs> and it's just like, you know, it's only, he's only a product of, of everything. And when, you know, we, we went through the history of Falwell Sr. You know, in his childhood and his upbringing, and so it's not a surprise, you know, what's happened to Jerry Falwell Jr. and him having to step down from Liberty. Um, anyway, it's, it's, I don't know, I just, to me, I can see, I can just see people being totally turned off to Christianity. It, it's just, you know, if these are the kind of people, if this is Christianity, you know, why don't we just live in the world? Forget it. So. Yeah, and it's a shame because that, it, that's the Christianity that the world was seeing, you know, because it was, on, yeah. it was televised. So 
people who weren't Christians just thought Christians were a bunch of kooks. They're just, just, you know, because that's all they saw. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Journalists scrambling to find out where these preachers came from found themselves in a theological puzzle palace. Some, like Falwell, were separatists, Baptists, self-described fundamentalists who had always refused to cooperate with others. Some belonged to the Southern Baptist Convention, a denomination whose leaders, since the day of J. Frank Norris, had regarded the separatists as schismatic ruffians. A few, like D. James Kennedy, a megachurch pastor in Coral Gables, were right-wing Calvinist Presbyterians. That's where it all started. A number, such as Jimmy Swagger, were Pentecostals. And Pentecostals, traditionally the least political of all evangelicals, were still regarded by most conservative Presbyterians and Baptists as holy rollers. They were also figures who didn't fit any of the old categories. Pat Robertson, for example, was a Southern Baptist, but also a charismatic. For journalists and other political observers, the confusion, if you have it, was such that they failed to note that most of the preachers, which the except, with, with the exception of Jim Baker, who inaugurated the Christian right had certain important things in common. Born in the late 1920s or in the 1930s, they were a generation younger than Graham, than Graham, Roberts, and McIntyre. They preached an inerrant Bible and a literal creation. All were premillennialists, and all of them came from the Sunbelt states of the South and the Southwest. <laughs> Can you say hallelujah? Uh, initially, Pat Robertson took the lead. The son of a U.S. Senator from Virginia, he had built his own television network in Virginia Beach and appeared on a weekly talk show, The 700 Club. In the fall of 1770. 17- 1979, he had brought a stream that should be of politicians onto his show and endorsed candidates. Mm -hmm. After the Washington rally, however, he retreated from the political arena for the rest of the campaign. The Pentecostals and Charismatics also retreated. Jim Baker never to return, having apparently decided that the risks of partisan political involvement were far too great for the TV ministries. He had some smarts there. So at that time, um, at that time when he was bringing these politicians onto his TV show, uh, they still had, you couldn't, wasn't the law still in place that Trump Wasn't it Trump that just undid the law, Um, keeping politics out of the church pulpits? You couldn't bring, you couldn't. um, Well, this wasn't actually the pulpits, the church. This was just a television show. I know. I was going to get to that point. It was like, like they found a way to do it, right? Um, Right. They found a way around the law to still push their tv shows yeah 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 so they kept it out mm. of the but did it through their tv shows yeah right right so they're still they were still able to endorse candidates um because they were doing it in the television show but it you know against the law to stand in the church you know up in the pulpit and endorse those candidates. Well, it says that after the Washington rally, he retreated from that political arena. 
And yet yeah. Also, also, yeah. also retweeted, never to return, having apparently decided that the risks of partisan political involvement were too great for their TV ministries. Right. So they so, yeah, to the TV and then they bowed out from doing it. Yeah, because they, I think maybe of the feedback or whatever they got from doing that, um, because it was partisan political involvement and, you know, the people watching, you know, were probably bipartisan individuals, we can guess, but it probably wasn't good for their ratings. Yeah. Uh, and their ratings, yeah. their money, and their power. Right. So it seems right. that all their work never seems to have anything to do with God. Their work, their work, all their work revolves around what brings them money. Yeah. Power. Yeah. It was just what would yeah. bring them power. Money. Power. Yep. And and the way they go about it is so deceitful uh, that. You know, God can't even, I don't know how how they could even, anyone watching could believe God would be in that because they use such deceptive tactics. Yeah. No, it's just, it's just, it's, you can't understand the human mind. That's just, I mean, it's, it, that will certainly be a study for eternity is the human mind and, and just the different I don't know how to explain it, but what attracts different people and yeah, I mean, here we can sit all like-minded and and say we wouldn't have we wouldn't have hung Jesus on the cross, right? You know? I don't know. Okay, we'll go on unless there's any other thoughts. Um, um, Falwell, on the other hand, persisted. Energetic, he traveled over 300,000 miles that year, holding rallies, recruiting pastors, giving sermons, denouncing abortion, the ERA, homosexuality, drugs, pornography, and secular humanism. By the fall of 1980, he claimed that the moral majority in the chapters in 47 states had registered 4 million voters. Wow. Republican politicians courted him, as did TV talk show hosts who found him genial and pithy of phrase. But then he had become the leader's leading spokesman for the new Christian right and the provocative name of his organization, the Moral Majority. Uh, how do you uh, say that uh, word? Synecdoche. 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 It's not a synecdoche. Synecdoche. Okay, it is synecdoche. Yeah. Okay. Synecdoche. I don't remember what that means, but I know we, yeah, we were taught that. That one. Um, Synecdoche. Okay, so uh, for the whole movement, for the movement as a whole, we'll see what it means. Here. Figure speech in which a part is made to represent the whole. Yeah, okay, or vice versa. Okay. okay. Um, a part is meant to read um, for the movement as a whole. Okay, the moral majority um, is a part for the movement as a whole. Yeah, synecdoche for the movement as a whole, a figure of speech in which a part is made to represent the whole. Okay, so the Mar majority was uh, to represent the whole of evangelicalism. Yeah, okay, just to. Um, um, where he's the spokesman for the new Christian right and the provocative name of his organization, the Moral Majority. So he's the spokesman for the Moral Majority, which is um, the synecdoche for the movement as a whole. Yeah. It's a part of it, but it's the whole. But it represents the whole. And 
basically, and yeah. ideology and everything. <clears throat> the new Christian right has had no single leader. What was remarkable about how about it was how it sprang up all at once among networks of pastors across the South, from Virginia to South Cal Southern California. Still, Falwell had a major role in developing the rhetoric that would take the disparate, dis, how do you say it, disparate? Disparate. Disparate. disparate, disparate. Groups. Yeah. I don't know where to put the accent. Disparate. Mm. Uh, and it's going to take those groups beyond their ecclesiastical differences and weld them into a coherent social and political movement. He also stood as a fair enough representative of the preachers who started the movement. His theology was much the same as that of the Southern Baptist insurgents, and he had close relations with a number of them. He was also well acquainted with many of the other leading figures in the movement. Among them, the new right political organizers who put it together. In the 1970s, he went through the process that turned right wing Southern evangelical leaders into culture warriors on a national scale. His career, in other words, tracked the development of the Christian right, as well as the upsurge of fundamentalism in the Sun Belt that preceded it. And if I could stop there, and I'm going to actually sign off because I have surgery tomorrow. Yes, I've been praying for you all week too. I would like to like mentally prepare myself and I'm supposed to shower with special soap, so I forgot all about that. So I need to go do that. And um, let me know how things go. You or David, let me know how things go. Yeah, it'll be, you know, it's not a major, major surgery, but, you know, yeah. I'll just see if we can have some kind of answer after the surgery. So yeah, so thank you for letting me participate, but I'm gonna bow out now and sign off and um, yeah, take that cleansing shower and go to bed because I gotta get up and take another one in the morning with the same soap. So anyway, all right, you guys have a good night. You too. Thank you, Kathy. God bless you. God bless. Thank you. Okay, who wants to pick up and read? I just kind of want to like take make a like a, a comment about just before we made this uh, we read this chapter. It just came to my mind, so I just I thought I'd, I'd like to make a compare and contrast. Um, when we finished this chapter, at the very end, it talked about. Uh, Falwell going into politics and in, via a Jeremiah. Remember when we were talking about that? And, yeah. And how it, 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 he, he said that it was there was a need for spiritual revival. Um, right there, clearly, Falwell is edging into politics via a Jeremiah about the need for a religious revival. In one of his crusade sermons, he preached the idea of religion and politics don't mix was invented by the devil to keep Christians from running their own country. Still, he had yet to take up the main issue that propelled conservative Christians into politics for four years. Remember when Tess did that presentation on the idolatry of conservative Adventism and John Adams uh, in 1798 did that fast day proclamation and he said that, you know, the reason why the world is going the way it is, is because, the, uh, you know, of sin in the country and that we have to repent and all that. And then Jedediah Morse goes into the pulpit because he was the pastor and he starts 
uh, he, he goes off on that in the form in his, in his um, you know, his uh, sermon in the format of a Jeremiah. And I just think there's a compare and contrast here because I, I'm looking at the presentation that I did. That's the reason why, because it brought to mind, hey, I remember this is all, you know, this, this is all coming to me because I did the presentation, of course, but I remember there was a president at the time that was saying these things. And then there was a pastor that, you know, that was linked to the president and he was, you know, they were working together to gather the people and they use this kind of Jeremiah. And then the fact that she writes this in her writings, that he used that, that um, Jerry Falwell used a Jeremiah. I, I just think that this is really amazing because in her presentation, you know, uh, these comments and these quotes are actually quoting that they use the format of a Jeremiah. And now Jerry Falwell is using the format of a Jeremiah. And I just thought that that was pretty amazing because there's a definite compare and contrast here. And also the, 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 there's no new thing under the sun. They yeah. The same thing. Yeah, yep, exactly. So anyway, I just thought I'd make that comment. Thank Thanks you. for bringing that out, Donna. I, I was thinking about how that, not like what you just said with John Adams, but I was thinking how they're going to do the very same thing again yeah. and, and resurrect resurrect that. Yes. The very same thing they did. They're going to use that same pattern again. Right. And, and you know, I don't know if Jerry Falwell uh, knew what, the, you know, the history of, 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 you know, 1798 or anything like that, but... He's certainly going in the footsteps of it, you know. I mean, it's it's kind of amazing, really. Because they got the, mind, the same mindset. Yeah, they do. They, exactly. they, they go into those same footsteps because they have the same mindset. Yep. To, to do it, so they continue to repeat what they're doing, what's being done, because of the mindset that they have. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Somebody want to read? Yeah, I can read a little bit. Okay. Where, where you at up here where it says one of, one, one of the reasons? Yeah. Okay. One of the reasons the rise of Christ, of the Christian right seems so sudden was that the protest against the culture cultural revolution of the long 60s ornated not with those who came its who, be, who became its leaders but with catholics and with conservative protestants at the grassroots level some influenced by the old right by 1979 protest against the progressive innovations in public school education had been going on for years, particularly in the Southern, in Southern California, where the John Birch Society flourished. And by the early 1960s, were encouraging resistance to what was seen as an in cult Caucasian, Caucasian, inculcation. Inculcation of morality, uh, revelous value by liberal educators. Some of these protests had made national news. In 1968, a Catholic housewife, backed by conservative political activists, led a successful two-year-long struggle against sex education in the high schools of Anaheim, California. Other protests involved the introduction of new generations of textbooks written for a multicultural society and designed to teach critical thinking and modern science. By far the most spectac uh, spe 
spectacular of the of these textbooks conflicts conflicts took place in Kanawha County, West Virginia, a county that uh, encompassed the city of Charleston and its rural um, hinter hinterlands. Okay. In uh, 1974, fundamental, fundamentalist pastors and parents protested the introduction of language arts, arts text that said were unchristian, unpatriotic, and destructive of the family. And, and an incitement to racial violence. There were demonstrations and a wildcat strike by sympathetic miners. The conflict went on for months. Outsiders, including members of the John Birch Society and lawyers from a conservative heritage foundation turned up. Eventually the protest degenerated into vandalism shooting, arson, and bombing. A committee of the National Education Association investigated the struggle and concluded that the trouble result, resulted in a part from a cultural gap between the school board and the isolated mountain communities. Within its jurisdiction, the cultural gap, however, turned out to be just as great an influence, just as great as great in affluent suburbs like Anaheim, where fundamentalists and Pentecostal churches had taken root. In the mid 1970s, concerned citizens in many parts of the country, including the Northeast and the Midwest, attempted to purge their schools of, familiar, of similar books, protested against sex education, lobbied for the teaching of creationism, and called for a return to the old uh, pedagogy, I don't know what that means. It has to do with teaching and um, like the observation, the science of teaching and observing. Okay, <laughs> you'll have to read that because I can't even. That... It says the method and practice of teaching, especially as an academic subject or theological concept. It's, so it's a method of teaching, method and practice of teaching. Yeah, it's like a scientific form of observation. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm not sure. I think it's pedagogy, but I'm not sure. It could pedagogy. be pedagogy. I'm not sure. Yeah, pedagogy. So I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's an odd word. So they want their hands in everything. And if I understood correctly, they rose quickly because of what was going on in the 60s with all the liberals and hippies. Hippies, I'm thinking, right? Well, the, the funny part about it is they, they wanted to be in everything. But all, the, all that kind of changing of things takes money. And then they were against taxes at the same time. So you, you can't have both. You got to have one or the other. Well, yeah, because the ministry money can't be used for political things. Right. Exactly right. Okay. Yeah. As for the Equal Rights Amendment, opposition to it was galvanized by Phyllis Shafley, a Catholic and a political activist. In 1972, just after the amendment passed Congress, Shafley had undertaken what seemed to be the 
hopeless cause of preventing its ratification. The proposed constitutional amendment read simply, equal equality of rights under the law <clears throat> shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. It was generally seen as an uh, an an anodyne, an anodyne measure that would help women overcome discrimination in the job market. The poll showed that two thirds of the public favored it. Both houses of Congress passed it by huge margins and with the National Organization for Women and other powerful feminist groups lobbying for it, state legislatures hastened to approve it. By the end of 1973, um, 30 out of the required 38 states had voted to ratify it and six years and six years remained to obtain the consent of the rest. At the time, Shafley had been one of the, of the few people organizing against it. Working alone out of her house in Alton, Illinois, she founded Stop Era a women's organization and sent out newsletters arguing that the amendment threatened the traditional family and all the laws protecting women. In a few years, Stop Era had thousands of members and though most of them had no previous political experience, it became so, it became a sophisticated lobbying group that changed the minds of many state legislators. And more important, mobilize other women's groups. Why Shafley had turned against the ERA was a question that puzzled many feminists and some of her own friends. She had a husband of and six children, but as Feminists pointed out she had hardly the traditional housewife. She was hardly the traditional housewife. She had taken an MA in gov government from Radcliffe uh, College at the age of 20. A few years later, she, she had managed a congressional campaign for a Republican candidate in 1952, had run from for Congress herself on the slogan, a woman's place is in the, in the house. Which house? Uh, no. Well, I just think she, that's kind of, she, she's running for Congress, right? With right. Places in the house. So she named in the house as in her home or in the house as in Congress. The house. I think I think it means the house in the Congress. Okay, okay. I think I, it's just I, a play I on word. The opposite. I, I think it means a woman's place is in the home. But this is my reasoning. You guys might be right, because she was a bulldog against feminists. I remember her. And yeah, what you're saying is that she why wasn't she a feminist? That's Fem even feminists couldn't understand why Shafley wasn't a feminist herself because she was actually doing what you would consider to be feminist things, right. like getting her master's, right, in, in government from college at 20. I mean, she was like on this fast road, um, right, to, to break the glass ceiling in a way for women. Um, Maybe she, managing maybe her marriage a campaign. What? Maybe her because this is like early on. Maybe when she got married, she changed her views or something. 
I don't. I, I know that her name comes up in the studies, and uh, and I just am, I don't remember some of the details of it. But I didn't know this part, or I didn't remember this part. But maybe she, maybe when she got married, her husband put her in place. I don't know. I I think she saw a a way for her voice to be heard by saying by falling into line under their rhetoric, right? The um this um conservative rhetoric it, yet she actually was a feminist but was fighting against feminists she she just went the other way so i was seeing that she she is a um what do you call that when you are opposite of what you how you behave not hypocrite there's another word uh, anyhow I, I don't think she was saying a woman's place is in the House of Representatives because she was fighting against the feminists. Well, because I was looking back in here because this is 1972. That's when she undertook what seemed to be a hopeless cause preventing its ratification. That's 1972, but this is 20 years earlier. I think it's uh, the House of Representatives because it's capitalized on, on the uh, quote yeah so cool. that would that would uh, reference the house well even still being a slogan it would right. be anyways but it was just a catchphrase kind of thing yeah so i don't know because because this is 1952 versus 1972 so 20 years have passed i i don't know i don't know if that came up in the studies why she she flipped right right but it is 20 years later. I didn't know that she ever flipped. So that that will be new to me. Well, I didn't know she like. ever flipped. What do you mean? She's fighting against feminism, but she was a feminist yes. to begin with. Yes, but she wasn't identifying herself as a feminist is what I'm kind of trying to say. Yeah. Right, he was, um, right, but if you, was, I don't know, I'm trying to think if I... If I was, you know, she or she is in Congress doing all the things that, that a feminist wouldn't do, would do, right? So even if she doesn't yes. identify with, she's still doing the things that a feminist does. And then she went to yes. a housewife with six kids. I don't think she could, I don't think she could see it. Yeah, I, don't think she, she, I don't think she could see the feminist part in herself. There you go. That's what I'm thinking too. She she just you know you 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 kind of your worst critic you know kind of thing, and you don't see what you're doing and but you can point out what other people are doing. It's the old uh, uh, log in the eye and you know and yeah, but that it seems too obvious for some <clears throat> for me anyway. It seems too obvious that some things are not <laughs> obvious to people. But she goes she gets an. An, an MA in government, Radcliffe College, and she runs for Congress. That a woman's place is in the House, like the House of Representatives. So it's completely opposite of a woman's place is in the home. I think that's what they're trying to say in this because when they start, they say why she had turned against the Equal right. Rights Amendment was a question that puzzles feminists because then they lay out all the things that she did that were feminist <laughs> you know yeah right. so didn't make that's no how sense. I'm reading it but what what didn't make, it doesn't make no sense you know her uh, actions are saying opposite of what she's saying yep I think, yeah. I think that um she had a really I think someone could be you know Falwell or somebody connected with him they needed to counter the Equal Rights Amendment. And they needed a woman that had, was well-respected, was educated. And I believe that someone had chosen her uh, to be the lead for the other side, a voice. And, it, you know, she, 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 she was very successful into bringing women into politics, conservative women, and getting them um, 
more uh, involved because before that, you know, this, um, she was mainly brought in, I think, in my understanding, for conservative women, not so much all women, but she wanted the conservative women to get politically educated so that yes, they could get involved with politics to sway the opposition, which would be the liberals, because the liberals at that time were gaining a lot of power. So she wasn't, I don't think she was saying that a woman's place is in the home. I think what she was saying is a woman's place is to be in the house in politics so that she, we, because she knew that it was through politics, maybe it was, you know, Jerry Falwell's influence, I don't know, um, that a woman's, you know, without the woman vote on the, 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 the majority of right, the right side, they're not going to make it because the left side was gaining so much power with, you know, the ERA, you know, the equal rights, civil rights and all that. So I do, in a sense, I think she was really saying that women, because she's a very educated woman. And I think she was, she came off, she, she had an appearance of a, you know, housewife look, but she was not, she was not really, you know, she was so educated and really knowledgeable. Um, she was, I think she was trying to draw conservative women into politics so that um, they could regain or, or try to gain back, you know, some of the, uh, the ground that they lost, that they were losing with. So, so it was a numbers <laughs> game, huh? Conservative women were just not interested in, mm -hmm. in politics and they didn't even think that they were, that they had any business in it. And she was saying, you do have a business. In fact, you have a right. You know, so almost like she was the spokesperson for the women and Jerry Falwell was the spokesperson for the men. So I, I'm thinking somebody along, you know, it, somebody commissioned her and said, you know, we need your help because we need women. You know, we need the women. And so she took up that. I don't know if I can find out information about that, but I don't think she was saying that women need to go back into the home. I, I think she I was. I don't think so either. I think she's. Yeah, I think she's with women. You got to get politically active because we're going to lose the race here you know I, I i like what you're saying there i but you can see it can be taken both it can be taken both ways for the ones because yeah, there was a lot of women who, oh well the men didn't like the feminist women either because it was changing their households like their wives were wanting to um take part in some of that right and and their wives were wanting to go out into the workforce and a lot of husbands wanted to keep their wives at home and right. submissive and so yeah it's very good what everybody's um bringing out mm -hmm. good good points I, I think you're right. I, I think she uh, she saw that she saw it was a numbers thing. She saw that the numbers weren't there to to uh, uphold the conservative um, you know the conservative party's uh, power. So she had to um, in, in you know empower the women to to. To prop up the the numbers in the on the conservative side, from what I, from what I'm seeing, uh, pretty interesting. But from then on, from then on, on had played an active role in the conservative wing of the Republican Party becoming a leader in the National Federation of Republican Women and serving as an Illinois delegate to most of the uh, subsequent Republican conventions. In 1964, she wrote and privately published a short book promoting Goldwater's candidacy and caused a sensation at the Republican convention that year. 
in a choice, not an echo, she argued that from 1936 to 1960, Republican presidential nominees had been chosen by a small group of secret kingmakers using hidden persuaders and physiological war, psychological warfare techniques. These kingmakers she maintained were members of the Eastern Internationalist establishment who favored the New Deal and Franklin Roosevelt's uh, in interventionist policy in, in Europe. In 1952, they had used a new propaganda weapon the Gallup poll to steal the nomination from Robert Taft. They were currently scheming to take the nomination away from Barry Goldwater, though he was a certain, though he was certain to win against Lyndon Johnson. After Goldwater's defeat, Shafley wrote five books on strategic defense policy which with a retired rear admiral, uh, Chester Ward, all of these books published between 1964 and 1976 made the same argument. Certain power, powerful government officials, principally Paul Nitz, Robert McNamara, and Harry, Henry Kissinger were plotting to unilateral, unilateral nuclear disarmament of the United States. These grave diggers, as Shafley and Ward called them, were communist dupes intent on the establishment of, the, of a world order. Concealing their real intentions, they met at a Council of Foreign Relations and communicated with each other by code of Foreign Affairs magazine. The plot might have been invented by Robert Welch and the founder of the John Birch Society and a supporter of Shafley. In the midst of these efforts to explain why the United States lacked the, the capability to win a nuclear war, Shafley ran for Congress again and published a monthly newsletter, Champion uh, Les Affaires Economics and States' Rights as well as Nuclear Armament. Well, that lady, she's a little on the crazy side. The era was thus a departure from her usual cons concerns. When, he, when a friend asked her to speak about it in early 1972, she replied, I'm not interested. How about a de debate on defense? At the time, she thought the, um, the amendment innocuous and mildly uh, helpful. But after reading the conservative analyst analysis of it, she, she changed her, her mind. The ERA was yet another liberal attempt to turn the federal government into a dictatorship. New thing under the sun. Huh? No new thing under the sun. Accusing the Democrats of the liberals and the work that they're doing to set up the government as a dictatorship. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I think uh, so many years of, uh, you know, people born in the, uh, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, 
and the threat of communism and socialism and the Cold War and, and all that good stuff rolled up into one, into your psyche. Um, you know, they, they play on that as, uh, as the Democrats trying to bring in socialism and, and t turn it into a, a world power, like they were saying. I think they were saying that about Obama that he was a globalist and all this other kind of stuff, yeah. And, you know. Yeah, so they accuse, they accuse the liberals of trying to set up the government into a dictatorship when they are the dictators themselves. Right. They're the but, ones that are doing that work. But they're like Shafley, they just don't see it. You know, they don't see, or they do or they don't, and they don't care, right? maybe one or the other. Definitely blinded. Yeah. It was also a new it was also a new issue when anti-communism no longer had the drawing power it once did. Setting to work, she developed a series of arguments against it. The amendment was unnecessarily because the 14th Amendment gave equal protection to all persons even though it denied women the vote. So it's unnecessary because the 14th Amendment already covers it all, but the 14th Amendment doesn't cover the women the right to vote. Yeah, uh, I, um, <clears throat> I, I was talking that with my mother-in-law the other day, uh, how the United States had denied women the right to vote. I just, I don't know, I just kind of, um, I just didn't get a good feeling from it, you know what I mean? It was, it was trying to hold on to that patriarchal kind of thing in the United States. And, uh, and I'd seen a picture where, um, um, I forget her name. She she led the 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 right for women to vote, and the people had actually beat her down. Uh, Susan B. Anthony, that's who it was. And the people voting uh, gathered around her and beat her down uh, physically, and just because she showed up to vote. And I was like, wow. And, and you know, a, lot of, a lot of people were um, applauding and I, I'd, I'd be sickened by that. I really would. You know, um, Francisco, you bring up Susan B. Anthony and I, do you remember the dollar? They finally yeah. put her on the dollar and it was it was so poorly done because it was smaller than a regular silver dollar. Right. So people got confused by it, right? Because it was like they what I, I'm trying to say is that it even diminished women when they finally um decided to put her on the dollar, they put her on a a uh, really small, bad representation of a dollar, and I don't even think they circulate them anymore because it looked so much almost like a quarter or a fifty cent piece. Same, it was, same, um, same thing. Do you with remember the, that? Yeah, I, I remember that, and the same thing with the uh, Sacagawea, the Native American uh, Indian girl, Indian lady they had put on the dollar and, and her coin was small as well. And I don't even know. I if didn't they, know that. Yeah. And they had put her on the, on the dollar and it was the same thing. They, they did this really small coin and it kind of looked like a quarter. And I go, how goofy is that? But yep. I don't know if they did that intentionally. I kind of, lean that way that it was intentional 
but I, I couldn't say because I don't have any facts in front of me. I know it just seems it just seems like it was intentional though, doesn't it? I, I'm with you. It does seem like somewhere, whether they realize it or not, subconsciously, they're still diminishing women. Well, you know? I don't know why and races. Yeah, I don't know why men are so turned off by that. I I don't know. I, I just don't I don't understand it. A country is only as strong as its women. I've heard that quoted before and and I believe it to this day, you know, kind of thing. And it's all craziness. <laughs> It would in, entail a vast and expansive increase in the federal bureaucracy and to do incalculable harm to the rights of women. The ERA, as she depicted it, would dissolve men's obligations to support their wives and children, force women into the workplace and regulate their children, uh, relegate their children to daycare centers. It also led to unisex toilets and legislation of homosexual marriages and women on the front lines of the battle with men and the battle lines are with men. Can we should pause it here. Okay. Um, and I was looking up, trying to look up on her, and some of you, I think, already did at one point in time. And, uh, but Netflix has, and Donna may have already shared this, but Net, no, not Netflix, Amazon Prime, I think it is, has the series. I don't know how helpful that is. Maybe there's a documentary that's more helpful. I think it's Hulu. Yeah, it says Hulu, Netflix, Amazon. Um, and so I looked up on my Prime, and it is on Prime. Um, yeah, it is on Prime. So I might try to look that look some of that up before we, I mean, after we finish here tonight, because I know she came up before as pivotal in all of this, and um, and I want to get more fresh in my mind the details of her because I looked at it before and just. It's hard to remember all this. <laughs> it's hard to remember it all, but I want to look her up again. It puzzles me too, like like they're saying it's why she was part of the, I, I mean, I don't get that either, why she would be part of the feminist movement when, I mean, be against it when she did all the things that she did. So. But Donna had some good insight on that. So anyways, I kind of want to look back into her a little bit again, refresh my memory. You know, I saw that. I wanted to watch it, but it's one of those series things, and I just hate watching those things that go on and on. Yeah, yeah. I was looking at that. It's got several episodes. It could just be a two-hour thing, but it's not. It's, it's yeah. one of those series. So yeah, I might look up, try to search on YouTube too, maybe. Because I think some, I think you sent some videos out a while back when her name came up, but um, but I'm gonna go back and look. Okay, we continue on. Um, Francisco, would you like to close in prayer? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Most holy and merciful Father. We thank you for this blessing that you've given us. We thank you for letting us congregate in your name, Lord, and to speak of the things that are happening and will happen. And even though we know it, that it was written, it still shocks us and uh, makes us nervous. But we, we pray that you uh, fortify our faith in, in things, Lord. 
and we uh, we thank you. We thank you for opening up our eyes and our ears. And we also pray, Lord, that you stay with us throughout the rest of the evening and be with those who need to travel home or, or whatever things they have going on. And uh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you. We thank and praise your holy name. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you.